So let's have a leisurely look at this. Uh, yeah, it's all visual, so you don't need me to narrate it. You can guess probably from the, the title exactly what it's about. Uh, good to have you here. I'm guessing we might have fewer than last time. Yeah, it didn't count last time. Maybe we had uh, 80? I, I don't know. We have 110, I think, last time I checked in the class. And so it's actually interesting walking around. So I got in on about uh, 10 to 7 and walked around on campus. Seems much quieter today on the second day of Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes than it did on the, the first. And so I think that's just normal human nature. Uh, and so that's people, people making choices that are uh, appropriate for them. So fluid mechanics, of course. Ice is a fluid, it's a solid once it's frozen, uh, and when it dumps into the ocean in a, a local way, it makes a big splash and you might get inundated. I guess in a global way, slow melting and carving uh, from ice sheets is a, a mechanism of um, sea, le sea level rise. That seems to be the least of our problems right now as we see that uh, perhaps, how do I get back out of this? see that perhaps some of the issues are more related to uh, severe storms which are developing and so clearly that's fluid mechanics you don't need me to talk about this because you can see the closed captions so this was a volcanic eruption somewhere off the north uh, on the plate boundary north of New Zealand and the raft that they're sailing through is a raft of the deposits that come out of the, uh, the volcano. If it's a subaerial volcano, they come out as ash and as explosive activity. If it's uh, submarine, then the same products come out and they either sink to the bottom of the ocean without reaching the surface or they float up to the surface if they're buoyant. So this happens to be uh, a pumice raft. So pumice is the things that in my day you used to use to take the epidermis off you. Uh, now I think you can get um, files that do that in the shower and the bath but that's basically what this is so all this is is rock with a bunch of bubbles frozen into it that have expanded as it's risen in the water column because the pressure is reduced and they float as a raft and so this covered a couple of a few square miles i think no real hazard uh, but they just had to, to sail out of it so yeah so you get the, the picture from that someone from the university of tasmania go to the next so we'll just warm up with this something maybe that highlights your responsibility in your professional life this is a tailings dam for mining dump the processing from the uh, the plant after it's been mined uh, into a big lake because it's fully waterborne uh, it sediments out and makes a dam the dam has a huge water content in it and the dam impounds a lake behind it the dam is quite porous and not very strong, and sometimes it can liquefy statically. If you hit it, it'll just, um, the pore pressures will rise and it'll become basically a liquid. And you'll see this maybe from two years ago. Unfortunately, there was a uh, town below it, and of course, uh, the people in that town didn't fare very, very well. And a big inquiry, a big problem worldwide in terms of these things, because they're a standard component of extracting minerals and of course the minerals are the things that your uh, battery in your iPhone or smartphone work on and so it's unavoidable to be able to have to recover these and so it's uh, but you can of course design them and of course if you design it wrong huge liability this is for Valet was the mining company and uh, obviously lawsuits related to to the deaths that occurred as I said before I'm not sure whether this is a spoof or not but let's look at it and see what you think it is I didn't look at it very closely again, but if it's what I remember it was, uh, it's a guy landing without a parachute into a big trampoline. I think that's it. I, I didn't run it last night to check. And so we probably don't need to see all the stuff going down. If we see other people opening their chutes and he doesn't, or she, uh, I guess uh, he, that person doesn't, then uh, it ends well, by the way, so you don't have to avert your eyes I guess this I guess it's a guy Luke <clears throat> and uh, again fluid mechanics the rate at which you go terminal velocity is controlled by drag on your body and gravity pulling you down the, ba the balance between those two forces defines what your terminal velocity is it's about 200 miles an hour 
Uh, you'll see a question in prior exams about uh, that from a, a not a pit bull, a, um, a Red Bull sponsored guy jumping out of a, um, a stratospheric balloon that had driven, uh, risen to above the stratosphere, you know, the highest uh, uh, parachute jump ever. And what's the last one? I guess it's opened all these windows. The last one might be a water spout. Quite beautiful, actually. And uh, from a couple of years ago, I think in the Gulf of Mexico, three water spouts uh, doing their thing. Well, obviously tornadoes. By the way, I've lived uh, in, in this area for, since 1985, 35 years. And last Wednesday was the first time ever that I had had a, a tornado watch of an imminent tornado in 35 years. We, there was a touchdown in Bolsberg uh, 10, 15 years ago, small tornado that tore up a traffic sign near the intersection at Oak Hall onto 322. If any of you know where that is, you probably don't if you're not locals. Um, in 1985, there was an out, a swarm of tornadoes in Pennsylvania that, and Ohio um, that killed about 40 people. Uh, the same swarm or related swarm killed about 40 people in Ontario. I was living in Toronto then, and uh, all of a sudden at four o'clock in the afternoon, the sky went very dark. Uh, nothing happened in the city, but uh, it was mayhem uh, elsewhere. So that's kind of... So the point to make, I guess, in all of this is that um, fluids and fluid mechanics are literally all around you, right? We're sitting in a fluid now. We're sitting in air. Air is a fluid, it's a gas, but it's a fluid. And many of the things that affect our lives are related to that. So when you're driving in your car, your fuel efficiency is sometimes controlled by the wind resistance. So you streamline cars so it's not a blunt object. Uh, Paralympics, I guess, are now on as of yesterday. So people will be wearing um, uh, wind resisting hats in the velodrome, right? With the long kind of uh, counterintuitive, you have a blunt front of your hat and a long tail with a cone to be able to make the air flow smoothly around it. You might think that you go into it like a Concorde nose and uh, be able to split the air, but that's not the, the, either it's not convenient or it's not equally do it. <laughs> Time to start. That's okay, I'm okay. So everyone's actually very good about turning off ringers on phones, so that's never, never an issue. So I guess that's uh, the kind of preamble we have. Uh, apologies for not catching the recording last time. Uh, it happened last year as well on Zoom, and I had to re-record it. So it doesn't affect you. If you were here yes, uh, on Monday, you'd have heard it, and so you don't need to hear me uh, uh, talking about it again. But I did record a 20-minute uh, concatenated version of what we talked about on Monday. Any quick questions before we get in turn? I don't want to, I want to do fluid mechanics. I don't want to get caught up in the, uh, the mechanics of how we run the course. Are there any outstanding questions that are just burning at you that we have to deal with? I'm hoping for no hands. I've got no hands, great. All right, so um, these are the uh, notes from this either 53 or 74 megabyte thing on the course resources page, which you can download at your leisure. They're pretty much what we'll go through in class. Uh, I, I won't tell you how to take notes uh, because over your time, uh, you will have worked out exactly what that is uh, for yourself, I think. I don't know why we're not there. I guess I will have to work out what width and, yeah, that's about right. So, um, comments for the good of the order. One one is online. Of course, if you're in class, you don't have to look at it. You won't get anything uh, extra from it. Uh, I usually trim the beginnings and the ends. Sometimes if there's a movie that I show that I think is gonna be a copyright bear, then I take that out uh, at the front. I got a copyright claim on YouTube, I guess, on Sunday night before the class on Monday to take down the Venometer movie, which I borrowed from someone. I don't know why they wanna do it. It's just an educational channel, so it's not really infringing on their commercial interests. So I, took down two movies that included that, actually for another class, although we use it in this class. So we will talk about the venometer, how you measure alcohol content using surface tension and density uh, tomorrow, I think, uh, Friday. Um, did anyone have a problem downloading the homework from edition seven and the exams? You notice I asked it that way, rather than say, who did? 
or who didn't. So I don't know. I don't need to know. But anyway, so if you have problems getting those, uh, do it. Remember what we mentioned. Homeworks, uh, you're probably going to be able to do those, and certainly you can find a workaround, I'm guessing. I don't need to know about it uh, for them. I'm sure there are solutions out there. Don't use them, uh, because I think they give you the skills that you need to, go, to go through the process in a test question of figuring out what the steps you need to take to solve a problem is. Um, but anyway, they're online. And do download the exams and do look at them. And so the tests are a necessary thing that you need to master, but not sufficient. Sorry, the, the, the homeworks are a necessary thing. But the exams are necessary and sufficient and necessary. I guess I'm getting backwards. The homeworks are sufficient for everything to happen, but the tests are necessary that you understand them and sufficient for you to get the grade. Necessary and sufficient. Uh, prerequisites we talked about. TA office hours we don't have set yet. And um, presentations we talked about last time. So I won't talk about again. If you want to see a good discussion of what the presentations might look like, maybe look at last year's 1.2 uh, class, this class, from 2020 because we talked a fair bit about it in class there. So I'm going to step into exactly what we'll talk about in this class, and, and those are fluids. And so we've looked at some videos that perhaps you can understand how fluids play some important parts uh, in our lives. Uh, there's just three quick slides here before we start getting a bit, bit more uh, technical about it. And that is to look at fluids in uh, natural systems, to look at fluids in engineered systems and to look at fluids in recreational systems, if, if you like. So I'll see if I can make this. So I, I will use this as a, as a mechanism to be able to show you the things I want to show you. So earthquakes, Haiti in the news, of course, a tragic situation, uh, sits on a plate boundary between the Caribbean plate and the Atlantic plate. Uh, it moved a week and a half ago uh, to compound the problems of 11 years ago when there was a big earthquake in Port-au-Prince. And of course, uh, motion on the plates, if it's subsea, it wasn't in Haiti, but if it puts up um, a, hang a hanging wall against a foot wall, then that rise makes the water above it rise the same way. If the water has a cliff face in it, it wants to get rid of that cliff face, and it's a tsunami is generated. And so tsunami-generated earthquakes are a big thing. We'll look at Tohoku. Uh, tomorrow from 2011, uh, the tragedy that killed 20,000 people as a result of the uh, East Japan earthquake of March 11th, 2011. Uh, hurricanes, tornadoes we almost saw on uh, last Wednesday. Hurricanes are a threat this time of year. Hurricane season runs, what, June 1st to either October 30th, I think it's October 30th. We had a drilling program in the Caribbean to drill a volcano. We only started in November because the, the hurricane season is ostensibly over by then. But circulation driven by the energy that's put in by heat coming off the ocean. Plate uh, tectonics runs on fluids. The fluid mantle uh, allows, forces the plates to move on it by drag and also by gravity of the plates as it subducts uh, in subduction zones. And these subduction zones are the places where these plate boundary earthquakes occur. Um, we will talk about Tohoku, but of course, before Tohoku, in your very early years, so if you were born around uh, 2001, then this was the Indonesian earthquake of Boxing Day, December the 26th, 2004, uh, that killed 150,000 people plus, uh, because we weren't really, uh, science wasn't really appraised of how, just how devastating these could be, because they haven't happened uh, in near time, and uh, it's, it is caused exactly by this phenomenon. Certainly within your time scale of life would be the, the horizon drilling disaster in the Gulf, 2010, I think, right? And the circulation of the fluid that occurs within the Gulf of Mexico that occurs from that. Certainly you're aware of the, the climate issue now, uh, sea level rise, uh, receding glaciers. Glaciers are ice. Glacier creeps. It flows at some very slow rate, just like glass creeps and flows at a very, very slow rate. But that's a, a fluid of some kind. And of course, it's water, which it changes phases from uh, solid ice to liquid water to gas vapor in its three phases. So we'll talk about those today. 
Mount St. Helens, 1980, 20 years before you were born, a lifetime ago for you, uh, before your li life began, and that's a fluid as well. Magma injected in the crust, a very viscous fluid, overpressurizes the summit. The pressures are large enough in thin gas within the magma to blow out the side, and it shut down air travel for six weeks and uh, causes huge evacuations. Maybe only, only 59 or 60 people died, so it was well um, uh, predicted in advance and, and therefore evacuated. So it's around us in terms of natural systems. It's around us in terms of things that we use every day and have engineered. You're engineers. You take science, natural science, and you use it to create things that hopefully help mankind. Horizon disaster, I guess, didn't really help mankind. The idea was that uh, gas came up around the borehole where it wasn't cemented properly, got onto the deck of the uh, rig, blew up the, the control tower, and then the rig caught fire, melted, and then the, everything was released from a, an open hole on the seabed. And it took... I don't know, it took um, four weeks, six weeks to be able to staunch it, uh, cost BP $32 billion in fines or something. So if you're the guy who designs that or gal who designs that, you're probably not very popular at work. And so, uh, again, it feeds into our sense of public responsibility. If you flew here or if you fly, I haven't flown since February of 2020, um, coming back from Seoul uh, in South Korea. But if you fly, you know that the principles of lift on an airfoil are what allow you to take off. Exactly the same principles that uh, drive a wind turbine um, in terms of lift on, on one side and, uh, and extra pressure on the other. If you've taken a plane out of uh, University Park as you walk up onto the tarmac, up the stairway onto the plane, you'll see pitot tubes, P-I-T-O-T, which measure a hole here and a hole in a separate canister around, or separate annulus around the side. It measures air pressure, which is a direct measurement of how fast you're going. So in addition to um, GPS, defining how far you're going by taking your position at different locations, you measure it directly from the pressure in the air that's generated by the speed you're going. And of course, there's a disaster related to these in the air flight plane that flew from uh, Rio to Paris and never arrived. It went through a thunderstorm. These f iced up, so they weren't working. And the controls of the plane were linked into that. And ultimately, unfortunately, the, the plane was lost. Wave energy, articulated structures on the ocean that take the motion of the ocean to be able to generate electricity through the, the, uh, the articulated joint. Um, contamination of uh, groundwater uh, is a fluid flowing in porous medium. Uh, some of you might be are, and you might be here, are environmental systems engineers who will deal with that. Tacoma Narrows Bridge, before we knew much about, or thought much about resonance in structures, if you get a wind blowing across a structure at a constant rate, it sets up, it sheds vortices on the other side of the deck, and that gives the deck an oomph at the top of the deck, then the bottom of the deck at some periodic uh, repeatable frequency. If that's the same frequency as the deck, you know, like take a ruler across the table and ping it, that's the resonant frequency of the ruler. If that forcing frequency is the same as the resonant frequency of the deck, it pulls itself apart, and that's exactly what it does. You can solve it very easily. You just put some weights on the deck to damp it out. It gives it a different frequency, uh, and you can control that. Energy transition, well, natural gas is an energy transition fuel. Maybe we're getting towards the end of that in terms of fossil fuels, but certainly as a bridging fuel, which is less carbon intensive than um, oil and even less carbon intensive than coal. A huge network of pipes that deliver this around the, uh, the US will continue, I guess, as a, a fuel. Some towns have already kind of banned it. Berkeley and California have said, you can't put a gas stove in your house anymore. It has to be an electric stove, getting ready for the transition to electrical power. These lines, of course, could be used for hydrogen, created by um, uh, splitting water using electricity from PV or some other way, or from wind. And so that's uh, another way that welcomes us into the kind of energy transition. And deep geothermal energy. Maybe if you're an energy engineer, actually in your, any of our majors in this uh, department, you might take my uh, geothermal energy engineering class in the uh, spring, which is, I think, the same time as Susan Stewart's 
wind energy class in the spring, but in the fourth year rather than the third year. And fluid mechanics in recreation. Uh, again, right at your entry onto this planet, I think it was, was um, Australian Olympics, the Sydney Olympics 2000. For one year, the Olympics had these shark suits, full suits. You'll notice now they're only uh, bare arms and bare legs, but these are super efficient. They make it easy to get through the water because they have little um, undulations on them that allow the water to cavitate, uh, to boil if you like, to turn to vapor, and they speed you through the, the system. And they, we got very fast times. Ian Thorpe, the Thorpedo, was an Australian who was a predecessor to Phelps, I guess, uh, for a year. Uh, everyone was wearing these that year. The America's Cup was won by the New Zealanders and taken away from the Americas, I can't remember when, uh, late 1990s, by an innovation of putting a fin on the bottom of the keel, which reduced drag. Uh, they always used to put the boat in the water with the shroud on the keel to be able to hide what the innovation was. Sail power, well, used to be how things were taken around the world uh, 150 years ago on clippers. Who knows whether it'll come back? This is a more modern version of this. Whitewater kayaking, I used to be a whitewater kayaker around here. I uh, haven't been in a boat for a while. But surfing West Virginia is surfing on waves. So gravity pulls you down the wave. The wave breaks and you can stay static in a stream just by the counteraction between forces acting under the boat, dragging you down uh, upstream and moving down the wave face by gravity. The perfect balance keeps you exactly static within the, the river. Golf balls have dimples because, surprisingly enough, dimples allow you to get turbulent flow with eddies and vortices at a much lower velocity. Turbulent flow makes a boundary layer around the ball, so it makes it go further because there's less drag on it. So the reason for dimples on, on golf balls are that. Uh, baseballs have a seam. The seam creates drag, so you can spin it, and it will spin both by the spin you give it, but also by the uh, by nature of the drag it creates as it rotates through the, through the air, and it will curve. And snowboarding is just like surfing. Uh, it's actually solid water that you're going over, but it's a balance between your weight, the drag on the bottom of the board, which isn't very much because you're on ice, and it's melting it, turning the ice into water, and the drag is your air resistance, which is holding back. So it's the drag on the board on the snow, and your wind resistance uh, on the air is what acts against gravity to be able to control your speed. If you have none of those and you're airborne, then ultimately you'll move at terminal velocity. And as we'll probably see in this class, um, is about a couple of hundred miles an hour, or 200 kilometers an hour, I can't remember which. But it's not infinite velocity, because we don't fall in a vacuum. If you fell in a vacuum, I guess it would be infinite. You, you keep on accelerating. And finally, the reason that you twist a, a football is to use the, the seam on here, the same as the seam on a baseball. And in this particular case, it allows it to go through like rifling on a bullet. Uh, if there are any inconsistencies in terms of weight or drag around the ball, because it rotates and it sees those inconsistencies uh, for the same amount of time, then any, any um, propensity to deviate in a systematic way is uh, cut out because that seam is rotating around through 360 degrees and the system sees it all the time. So that's why we might be interested in, in, in fluid properties. So what we'll do is we'll start talking about fluid properties today. That's a precursor to be able to understanding uh, pressures within fluids, which is our second week, and then forces on structures as a result of those pressures in the third week. And then, then we'll start talking about moving fluids. And so the first part of our, our curriculum is dealing with this. So we'll talk about these things. So this is where I get going. So talk about fluids versus gases. We'll talk about dimensional homogeneity. We'll talk about different properties of mass and weight. We'll talk about the equations of state as the ideal gas law, equations of compressibility. And probably this will be about as far as we get today, would be my guess. So that's kind of where we're going with, with this. The other things on this we'll, we'll talk about next time. What am I going to do now? I am going to start writing. So I don't know how off. You can see this, right? Just fine, hopefully. 
So, this is where we are. I use writing because it slows me down. And you can write if you wouldn't, or if you just want to watch, that's fine as well. So we talked about fluids in life. Uh, let's talk about fluids in, in general. So fluids exist in a variety of different states, and so it's convenient for me to, to draw them here. They exist as solids. They exist as liquids. And a liquid will fill everything up to a free surface, right? And they'll exist in their final state as gases. So I kind of misspoke, right? These are fluids. This is perhaps not a fluid, although all solids do flow at, at very uh, slow rates. The difference between a solid and a fluid is that if I, for instance, would apply a force on the top of this, then this would try and deform. And as long as I hold that force uh, on the top, it'll stay deformed. If I put a force on the top of a fluid, as we'll find out tomorrow, when you listen to the movie, you'll hear this annoying click from the pad that's doing this. If I do it on a fluid, the fluid will flow and it'll keep on flowing. So I apply a force to a fluid, it will move at a constant velocity. Uh, it's modulated by the viscosity, but that's the difference. If I put a, a stress on a gas, it'll beha behave the same way as a, as, a, as a liquid. A liquid can have a free surface. A gas will expand to fill the, um, the volume that you put it in. And the important properties that we might want to look at are these. And we'll use standard terminologies for this. So you'll know what density is. It's a mass over a volume. We will always use, in this class, SI units. No English units. Um, and so the SI unit for density is kilograms per meter cubed. And um, you can imagine that for these different materials, the density of a fluid is, a solid is high. The density of a liquid is high-ish. Maybe that could be medium. And certainly for gas, it's low. And so this is just my terminology of high, low, etc. You'll, you'll get used to this. Um, viscosity. The viscosity uh, is of a solid, again, is we can just dispense with this high of a liquid it's say medium I guess medium might be better than high low and for a gas it's low viscosity we will talk about it in much more detail but we use Newton's law of viscosity where the shear stress that we apply on the top uh, gives through a term mu which is the viscosity dynamic viscosity operating on a velocity change divided by a distance. And so this distance actually would be x here. Doesn't matter. But this is dynamic viscosity. Okay. Yeah. Sorry? Is this the x? Does that, does that mean the change in x? Yes, it does. So they're both changing. Too detailed. They're yeah. both changing. Changing in x. So, so if you want to have this as dx, then it can be. It's the x direction. So, substitute. Too, too, too much information for now, I think. That's not what I want to do. And the units for this, the SI units, are Pascal seconds, as we perhaps will determine later on today. Uh, and so viscosities change as you move from different uh, media. We'll talk about uh, modulus. Modulus is the terminology E, 
I guess I didn't write these. Viscosity is mu. And the definition of modulus is the change in volume that you get from a change in pressure. So if we're looking at this, the total volume of this would be, I always write a bar through my vol volumes, so it's not confused with uh, velocity. And a change in volume, I guess, would be if you make this container slightly smaller by changing the volume by some amount. And of course the pressure would be the pressure that you see changing in this as a result of this. So pressures and densities look a bit the same, so uh, be aware of that. And I guess actually this also has a minus sign in front of it. And so the idea is that the modulus of something solid, as I try and squeeze this down, it doesn't move very much, it's very rigid, so it has a high modulus. The change in volume is very small as I push on it. If I push on a balloon, uh, it'll, the volume will change a lot, and so the modulus is low, and liquids actually are closer to high modulus than low. The, the modulus of uh, water is something like 2 gigapascals. For a rock, it's something like 10 gigapascals, so it's not very large. The modulus for uh, air is something like um, 100 kilopascals. So not two gigapascals, uh, it's um, four orders of magnitude different, 4,000 times different. And we'll also talk about compressibility. And compressibility is one over modulus, it's just the reciprocal of it. So if something's very high modulus, by definition, uh, it's very low compressibility. So these would be the, the reciprocal of these, so this would be low, this would be low, and this would be high. And so by definition, I didn't say what the units are. The units have to be pressure divided by volume over volume. Volume over volume has no units, and so they have to be units of pressure. So it would be newtons per meter squared, which is also a Pascal named for Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician. So units of compressibility would be the reciprocal of those. So it would be 1 over Pascal's. Okay. So those are, are units that we'll use. As I say, in this class, for, ex for the tests and the purpose of all, most of the examples I give, SI units only. Tests, absolutely, never, never has been an English unit. Some of your questions, if you looked at them already, uh, assignment questions, uh, have English units on them, just because it's kind of ubiquitous. I don't work well in those, despite perhaps coming from a country that invented them. Uh, okay, so some of the disciplines are SI. Certainly if you do a degree in Canada, all your classes would be in, uh, in, uh, in SI units. Uh, here, disciplines uh, and engineering has tend to go across the boundaries. Uh, the famous, I can't remember, the famous NASA uh, snafu where the design moving between English and metric units meant it missed the moon or something. I can't remember what the deal was now, but you have to be a bit careful with units. Um, interesting enough, for some of you in petroleum engineering, many of the equations in petroleum engineering are, dis are dimension specific. They say that you have to use a pressure in pounds per square feet, you have to use a viscosity and slugs, and you get the results in gallons per, or barrels per day. Most of the equations we use have um, something like dimensionality written into them. So we'll spend a little time about talking about dimensionality. And that is that all the things that we talk about, we can think in terms of mass, length, time, and temperature. For SI, mass is the kilogram. For SI, length is the meter. And for SI, time is seconds. 
and temperature is degrees Kelvin or Kelvin. So that's the, the dimensions that we can think of. Mass, length, and time are dimensions that we can divide any parameter that we look at into those fundamental dimensions. And so it, sound, it makes sense that any equation that we have, for instance, if we look at, for instance, the easiest one to look at is area. And if we look at what an area is, then this is x, this is y, this is x1, x2, this is y1, y2. Then by definition, the area is equal to the integral x1, y, x2, or the other way around, integral y1, y2, dx, dy. And if we integrate that without the limits, we'd end up with x, y, plus c. If we had the limits in it, we'd end up with x, y, evaluated at each of these limits. x1, I guess, uh, x2, x1. Uh, sorry, wrong. Same result. But the main point is, that the units of this have to be in meters squared, or length squared if you want. And so this equation on the, the right-hand side, and indeed this equation, have to be in the same units. So this has to be in units of meters squared, or length squared. And also this term, since you're adding apples to apples, has to be the same as well. So, that's, so when you look at the dimensionality of, a pro, pro, of a, an equation, Immediately, if you check the dimensions on both sides, if the dimensions aren't the same, the equation's wrong. It doesn't mean it's right if they do match, but it means it can't be right if they don't. That's not true for petroleum engineering, apparently, because many of the, the equations actually have the, the units that you have to apply for that particular term in the equation and the answer. But in all the equations, most of the equations that we use, this will be the case. The only thing I think it might not be the case for is the Manning equation when we talk about open channel flow. So anyway, so think about that. So it's a, a useful idea to be able to think about things. So what else can we do with this? Uh, well, let's talk about fluid dynamics, just as an example as well. How are we doing for time? We're at 8.30. So in your physics classes, maybe you've seen Bernoulli equation written between two points. Uh, we'll use x. We'll use z as vertically upwards. And you know in Bernoulli, you write the elevation at a particular point, you write the pressure at a point, and you write the velocity at a point, and you write the same variables at some other point. V, not V bar. Velocity, not volume. And so you probably uh, know Bernoulli we won't talk about it, you certainly would have seen it. Rho g plus uh, v squared over 2g. You should know these terms. Elevation, length, pressure, we just talked about it. Density, acceleration due to gravity, velocity, acceleration due to gravity. And this equals a constant on a streamline. So it equals the same value here overall as it does at this second location. And so this is a fundamental law. The units of this, even if you don't know what the units of this, since this has to be in terms of uh, meters, then each of these terms have to be in terms of meters as well. And uh, you might also be aware that in terms of this expression, this is also equivalent to This is Newton's second law, right? F equals ma. Written a bit differently, just to subtract it from zero. My reason for writing it that way is that if you take it and divide this, whoops, divide this equation to, to this, is that these two terms on the left-hand side represent forces, the pressure that's applied on a swimming pool in the bottom in a static fluid, and how it changes with depth. And these represent inertia, taking that fluid 
trying to move it through the air, you accelerate it through the air, you've got to work against inertia to be able to move it, and that acceleration is doing that work against it. So it's just a balance between those, those forces. So this is kind of a fundamental relationship that, that we'll use. And I guess to make the point about dimensionality, which is what we're talking about, these terms have to be homogeneous, all have to be in terms of uh, length. Why don't I change color just for a change to just give a bit of variety. Then what we can do is we can look at non-dimensional parameters that, for instance, take these individual relationships. And what am I going to want to do with this? I'm going to take this and divide it by this term here. So pressure over rho g divided by v squared over 2g. The dimensions of this are length. Dimensions of this are length. Dividing a length by a length. By definition, this is non-dimensionless. If I cancel out some of the relations, get rid of the g, get rid of the 2 because we don't care about it, this is referred to as the Euler number, which we will not use today, but we'll merely note that it exists after the famous Swiss uh, mathematician. Uh, it's equal to a pressure, the ratio of the forces due to pressure relative to the inertial forces. So it's ratio of pressure force to inertial forces. And it's uh, useful in determining lift on a wing because you can say how fast the air is going, you can calculate how much pressure comes from that change in force from accelerating. So that's one expression that we can use. We can also do the same for the elevation versus the velocity head. And if I do this off to this side, I guess, then what do we do? So again, we'll take this term, v squared over 2g. We'll divide it by this term here. So this is 1 over z. And so this is going to be equal to uh, v squared over gz. Don't care about the 2. And typically it's shown with a square root. Take the square root of the whole thing. And if I do that, then it ends up being v square root over gz, and this is called the Froude number, Froude number. And that says something about the role of gravity forces in a system. So it's important when you're looking at drag on the bows of ships, where you get a bow wave uh, resisting motion of that boat, and it's a, a, a non-dimensional number. There's one other non-dimensional number that we can't get for this because we don't have viscosity, but you'll probably recognize the name. Osborne Reynolds, Reynolds number, and it's the ratio of uh, inertial forces over viscous forces. We can't do it from Bernoulli because Bernoulli assumes that viscosity is zero, and so viscosity doesn't turn up here. So the Reynolds number is something like a length, a velocity, a density, all divided through by a dynamic viscosity. This term that we talked about um, up here. And so those are three numbers that are incredibly important uh, in this class. We'll talk about them. And the point is that they're ratios of forces. And since they're ratios of forces, by definition, a force by a force is zero dimensions. No mass, no length, no time. And so they're, they're important in being able to scale behaviors in, in fluids. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, how do I get there? So I wanted to go to this. I want to go back to the notes. So you'll see that I jump around a little bit. We've talked about all these things. You can go back. Uh, I prefer to talk about them rather than belabor them. Exactly the point we've made so far about mass, length, and time is that every single thing, quantity, that we talk about can be defined in terms of those. There are two systems. There's force length and time, and there's mass length and time. Maybe I'll change to red. Exclusively, I will use this. Doesn't mean your textbook won't use force as well, but I'll tend to use mass length and time. 
As we mentioned before, there is another variable that is temperature, which is in Kelvin. So there are four variables, not just three, but for this class, uh, we're largely isothermal, so we don't care so much about temperature. And so acceleration is uh, meters per second squared, length per meter squared, etc. And uh, so you can get all these equations out of it. And it's quite easy to be able to convert. They look kind of complicated, but of course you can use your own skill and intuition to figure out what these would be. For force, for instance, we know that force is equal. You might not know what the mass length and time units are for force, but you certainly know Newton's law. That's the one equation you need to know in this class. And the units of that would be mass, would be, well, let's do it in terms of, um, so mass would be in terms of mass. Acceleration is meters per second squared. So it's length T minus two. So the units for force have to be exactly that. You probably don't know what the units for viscosity are, unless you are super keen, but you can work that out as well. We said that Newton's law of viscosity is that a stress is equal to viscosity times a change in velocity divided by a change in length notwithstanding what this means right now. We don't care about the derivative operators on this, but we can presumably rewrite this as equal to, let me write it this, as viscosity is equal to shear stress multiplied by x divided by v. Uh, furthermore, we can write this as uh, stress is equal to a force over an area, right? Stress is equal to force over area. And length is equal to length. And velocity is equal to length, whoops, length over time. We know that this force is equal to mass times acceleration. So I guess we could put that in there. And it becomes a manipulation, but the point is you can get there from just by using the, the quantities that you know. You might not know all the quantities, and I think the first assignments you have in your homeworks are basically do a bunch of these. So you'll get some practice doing that. So viscosity ends up being mass over length minus 1, t minus 1. So you can work out the dimensions of all of these. So if you find this not very straightforward, then relook at this. Look at your book, figure out how to do it. But that is your, your first assignments that you'll end up doing uh, in the class. OK, now I'm going to move back to something. I guess I'm going to move back to this. What now? All right, get rid of this. I hope it doesn't seem too staccato for you. Um, that's that's my, the one worry I have in this. So in terms of pressure and temperature. The easiest way to introduce that is to note that both pressure and temperature have two scales. They have absolute and gauge. And absolute pressure is zero, but atmospheric pressure in terms of absolute pressure is uh, 101 times 10 to the 3 newtons per meter squared. In other words, 101 kilopascals, roughly, not exactly a number that you might want to remember. Gauge pressure for pr atmospheric pressure, which we feel now, is zero. So a vacuum has to be minus 101 kPa by definition. And so if you increase the pressure by some amount, 
then this would be um, 10 megapascals. You should know your Latin units, right? Uh, Killer is a thousand, mega is a million, uh, giga is a thousand million, peta is 12, 10 to the 12, etc. So you need to know those. And so this would be 10 MPA plus 101 KPA. Can't add them directly together because these are different uh, magnitudes, but that's uh, pressures. So for temperatures, we work on two scales as well. And so for the SI scale that we work in, there's also absolute and gauge. I, I guess absolute and I guess it's not gauge, is it? it's, it's uh, normal, what we think of. So absolute pressure would be uh, in Kelvin. So this would be in terms of temperature zero Kelvin, free, you freeze ice at 273 Kelvin, and room temperature is something like 293 Kelvin. And these conform to zero degrees centigrade. Kelvin and centigrade are exactly the same size. Uh, this would be 20 degrees centigrade, and this would be minus 273. It's not exactly 273, but it's roughly. And so we have to work in terms of, of those, those units. So be aware of that. The importance of that in terms of what we'll talk about in this class is we'll talk about equations of state, not me. I worry when I hear that because it means my computer is shutting down. which is also the ideal gas law for you, or equations of state for gases at least, for gas is the ideal gas law. The gas law is that absolute pressure is equal to density multiplied by the gas constant for that particular gas multiplied by absolute temperature. So IR equals the gas constant. I'm not going to tell you what the units are because I can never remember them, uh, but of course you could rearrange this equation in terms of the gas constant. So for, for gas I, whatever gas would be, nitrogen, for air, uh, oxygen, hydrogen, whatever you want. Importantly, the pressures have to be an absolute. So these have to be absolute pressures and absolute temperatures because they're relative to this scale, which everything shuts down at zero degrees uh, Kelvin. We can rearrange that in terms of, for an, a universal gas constant. Universal gas constant is R bar, divided by the molecular weight of the gas. of uh, hydrogen or nitrogen or whatever the gas is, which allows you to d define that. And of course, we can also, if we have a container that contains this gas, and if you do something with this container, if you fill this with gas, and then say you compress it as an accordion, so it's less volume, so the top here comes down by some amount, just like we kind of alluded to, in talking about compression of a gas, we'd find out that we can also write this expression uh, use, usefully as, instead of a density, a mass divided by a volume. Just by exchanging this expression for another expression. And so, we can use that to be able to say something about the behavior of this, this system. Um, so, yeah, before I leave, uh, we talked about the states. This is the first of the, the gas states that we'll talk about. But we've kind of, and I want to do it today, we've talked about this in terms of these three different components. 
So maybe uh, just one last thing before we take off is we can look about what this equation of state means for us in, a, in kind of a practical sense as we look at this. Can I make it larger? Yes, good, big enough. So on a phase diagram for water in this particular case, we now know enough to realize that we sit at one atmosphere. So this is where we sit. If we sit at one atmosphere and it's snowing outside, then the precipitation is in ice. If it's above zero, it'll exist as water. And as we traverse 100 degrees centigrade, the boiling point of water at atmospheric pressure, we'll traverse into a gas. We know that ice in terms of the densities and the, the moduli are, they behave differently. Um, I guess we should be interested in some interesting points on this figure. The first is that if we go down to a lower pressure, then we change the temperature at which ice will freeze. It will be warmer uh, before it freezes. And if we uh, change the, the pressure, um, it will also affect the, the vapor pressure. So this line here represents the vapor pressure. And it means that at any particular pressure that you find yourself at, as you increase the temperature, you'll first vaporize ice and it'll go to water then you'll vaporize water and it will go to vapor uh, as you go across this. If you go across this at a lower pressure, then the span of the temperatures where water can exist is much reduced. In other words, it will boil at a much lower temperature on top of Everest. The classic question about does it take longer or slower to, to cook food on the top of Everest than it does at sea level, it takes longer because the boiling temp point temperature is lower, and so the heat that the food that you're boiling can get up to is lower, and so it has to spend longer time at that particular temperature to cook. Um, the critical point is where water and gas phase are not particularly well defined, and so inside this critical point, you end up with a supercritical fluid. the holy grail for geothermal systems because if you can drill deep enough into Iceland to hit supercritical fluid, the amount of energy of it is huge. It's the holy grail for carbon capture and storage because you want to get a lot of carbon dioxide into the ground and at higher pressure and at higher temperature of the subsurface, it starts acting, it has the viscosity of a fluid but the density of a liquid. So it's very dense, but it has low viscosity. So it's easy to pump in because of low, uh, low viscosity. And it's, you get lots of stuff in because per unit volume because it's high density. And so that's the holy grail. The other point here is the triple point. Not so much important for water, but certainly important for CO2. If you go to the creamery and buy your ice cream, they'll pack it in dry ice. Dry ice, when it uh, increases in temperature, instead of going to liquid carbon dioxide, it sublimates directly into CO2 vapor. So it doesn't go across this boundary where it goes from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Instead, it goes directly from a, a solid to a gas. And so this is the, uh, this, this curve here on the bottom is the vapor pressure curve. And it's kind of a steady state condition where a fluid which finds itself at this particular pressure and temperature is not in steady state. It means that the same amount of gas is going into to liquid as liquid is going into vapor. So the exchange of molecules across that interface is exactly one for one. It's in e equilibrium. It doesn't mean that all the molecules that are gas stay gas and all this, the fluid ones stay fluid. They're exchanging, but they're exchanging at exactly the same rate. And so this is an important parameter for us to look at the transition um, from water to uh, gas. You know, a practical application of this is uh, submarines and stealthy submarines creeping around in the deep. Propellers, the, the, the screws, the ship screws or the propellers on the submarines are, act like a, an airfoil. You get low pressure, just like on the top of a wing, sucking the plane up. That low pressure vaporizes the water, turns it from water into gas, and those bubbles you pick up on sonar. So to run silent and run deep, 
you have very big propellers on the back of submarines that move very slowly, create very small pressures, and therefore don't cavitate uh, the water, turn the water into vapor. Two minutes over, that's not bad. Uh, I'll hang around if people want to ask questions, come on down. Uh, you're not quite ready to do the assignments. On Friday you'll have enough knowledge from these particular parts to address the assignments.